Welcome to video number seven in module 301, Job Search Strategies. At the end of video six, I asked you to think about references, and this video will explore a little bit of that subject. When employers contact past employers for references, they aren't just looking for evidence that you're a great candidate. They're also looking for evidence of what I call alignment, which basically means that the story you tell about yourself through your resume, cover letter, and interview match the story the employer has to have about you as well. They look for that because they want to see that you're self-aware, that you really have a strong sense of how you fit into the workplace, because that's a foundation to any growth or development work you do. If you have a false sense of your abilities, chances are you're not going to improve very much. And of course, they're looking for evidence that you're honest as well. If there's any evidence that you haven't told them the full and accurate truth, this can often be the end of the job application process. Some of the questions that employers frequently will ask of the reference are attendance and punctuality. In fact, this is probably the very first question they'll ask. And if the answers aren't to their liking, they often don't need to complete the rest of the reference. When they're doing attendance checks, what they mean is not just did you have excused absences, but how many did you have a habit of contacting the employer both beforehand as well as afterwards to see what you missed? And did you have patterns of attendance issues? Are there ongoing issues that might cause you to continue to have those patterns? They're also interested in punctuality, meaning the time you arrive at work and the time you leave. People who arrive early and who are willing to stay late, even if that's past their normal hours, typically get a much stronger reference than those that show up late or leave early. They'll also ask your reference for evidence or examples of teamwork skills and communication skills. They're not really interested anymore for just a broad statement from references. They want to actually know about times that you've demonstrated these things. And the same is true when it comes to your organizational habits. They'll ask questions about whether you organized work and time, money and pressure effectively. They'll also ask questions designed to see whether you can receive feedback or even more importantly, whether you can improve your performance after being given it. They want also to know whether or not you can work without having a supervisor constantly check on you or change your performance. They want to know whether you can handle pressure such as deadlines or working with people who have demanding personal styles or working in crisis situations. They'll also want to get a sense of your professionalism in terms of whether or not you're a person that's mindful of ethics and values and have a strong sense how to conduct yourself in a way that is fitting of this profession. They'll also ask a question that is a much more broad question, and it's almost always the very last question that they ask in a reference, and it sounds like this. Do you have any concerns at all about this candidate working with a vulnerable population? And this question is really just a very broad way of finding out whether or not the reference has any flags, even if they don't feel comfortable getting into details, if the employer checks with the candidate's reference and finds out that there's some kind of concern, they'll often stop the hiring process right there. What they won't ask is whether or not you did well on tests or on courses or essays. That isn't going to matter. They're much more concerned about the employability skills that emerge through the work you've done, even if they're using me as a reference. You should expect to use professional references only meaning past employers, even if they're not from this sector, volunteer and practicum supervisors, and academic instructors from college on up. Don't expect to use personal references such as childhood mentors, friends and family, even somebody you've babysat for on a personal basis is not likely to be a great reference at this point anymore. And bring all of the contact information and the correct spelling of the person's name, organization and title to the interview itself, even if you have submitted something with it before, even if you've got letters of reference. It's really important that they be able to have an actual conversation with your references. You can bolster your references in two ways. First, you're more than welcome to use me as a reference. If you graduated from our program, it means I'm comfortable giving you a reference. I will always answer questions about you accurately. So if you had fantastic written work, but not very good attendance, I'm going to answer the questions accurately and you're more than welcome to ask me what am I going to say. It's also okay to go and get additional experience after you leave the program. 
I've seen students go and volunteer in places and convert that volunteer work into employment in many cases. If you're interested in working for a particular organization and they don't seem to feel you have enough reference information yet or enough uh, experience, ask them if you can work for them as an intern or a volunteer. Not only will you gain hours, but probably somebody within that organization will now become a reference for you and that's a really valuable tool. Remember that references are best when they are recent, relevant, and from people who supervised you. If you have been out of the field for a while, maybe you had a baby or you went back to school or you're dealing with some kind of health concern, it's really important to go back and get some recent references. And again, this might involve going and finding a job, doing some volunteer work, or starting off in a smaller job that has a little bit easier entry than working right back up at the full-time level. And make sure that the job is as relevant as possible if you can. People who have supervised you are the ones who are going to be most mindful of whether or not you had employability skills. So select them. Make sure you know your references well. It's remarkable how often I've done a reference check for somebody and found out that the reference was surprised they were selected because they didn't necessarily have a lot to say about that candidate that was positive. Ask your references before you list them if it's okay to use them and summon up the courage to ask them what they might say about you. Because as I said, I've often had people that didn't say what I think uh, the, per the candidate expected. Describe the relationship to the reference in the actual reference document. For example, let them know if you were their supervisor, if they were their, if they were your supervisor or whether it was a volunteer position. And make sure that your references are easily contacted. For example, people sometimes retire and we forget to go and find out if they're still at the same organization. I have students who ask me whether or not they can use me as a reference and they've graduated 10 years ago. It's a brilliant um, process and they check to make sure I'm still at the same contact information, still remember them, and I'm still willing to be a reference. So make sure you do that. It's also important to understand that you'll be asked to prove your qualifications. These are the uh, pieces of paper or documents that prove you actually have the credentials you claim to have. So you'll need to provide them with a copy of your certificate, of course, and most places will expect to see evidence of these credentials as well. Nonviolent crisis intervention, first aid and CPR for, not, for healthcare providers, and food safe level one. So it's a great idea to photocopy or scan those documents and be able to add them to your application. If you have your class four license or even your learner's license, make sure you include that. And often you'll be asked as part of the application to check off any specific areas of expertise or experience that you might have had. And these are areas where you might not have received a piece of paper that shows you've had it, but still your prior experience in these areas will be considered an asset. They include things like augmentative communication, American Sign Language, the use of behavior management techniques, any kind of mental health support, providing physical care to people, working with children and youth, and experience with people who have specific populations, such as Prater Willie or Fragile X. Um, if you can talk about people with these particular needs, then there may be somebody in that organization that has these very unique or even rare conditions, and you may be giving yourself a significant leg up. We're getting close to the end, but we have one more video after this, and it's gonna be all about poise and competence. And I want you to take a moment to do one more blog entry on this. No matter what you wear or how strong your resume, if you don't carry yourself with poise and confidence, nothing will be heard. Those things will communicate more loudly than any other thing that you do. So thinking about yourself, I want you to name three things that you do well when you're communicating with poise. And I want you to focus, as we have so often, on the concrete, on actual actions. Think about the tone of your voice, your eye contact, your body language, your gestures, your posture. Think about the words you use to describe yourself or the clothing or artifacts you bring to the equation. Think about all of that and pick three things that you think you do well to demonstrate that you feel poised or in control of yourself, that you have command of the situation. And then I want you to think of one thing where you can improve and describe how you might go about improving. What's the one little crack in your armor that might show people that you're not completely comfortable being in that position? 
Again, it might be a tone of voice thing. It might be a nervous habit that you have. But be specific about both what it is and some basic but helpful tools you might use to improve. For example, don't overlook the value of practice or of utilizing a mirror. Take a moment and write your blog entry and then move on to video number eight, which is our last video.